example. I asked 50 people to each choose an object from the collection of the Philadelphia Museum of Art and write about it on a postcard. Their text could take any form they liked, could relate to their choice directly or tangentially or hardly at all, as long as it fit inside of the six by four and a quarter inch rectangle with room to spare for an address and a stamp. The image of the object would be the reverse. I'd make multiples of each postcard, 100 to be exact, and send them out in the mail to a matching 100 subscribers once a week for a year. At the end of the year, looking at a stack of 50 postcards, one would find a strange and personal guide to an institution so singular in this city that it is often known only as the art museum, as if there were only one. My relationships to both that museum and to the postcard form are not so simple. Both of those hinge to some extent on the idea of secrets. The understanding that the museum and I have with one another is easier to explain. I am loath to admit the force that Marcel Duchamp's like great work at Tantonet exerts over me. The experience of it, perhaps the most famous part of the museum's collection, seems too simple or too obvious of a metaphor for why that institution appeals to me so. But it is remarkably apt. Each of us here remembers our own first experience with the wooden door and what lies behind it, of walking down a long hallway framed by Cezanne's large bathers, turning right under Lewitt's azure ceiling, and passing through the shadow of the large glass into a darkened room with a grease-stained wooden wall, which upon closer, ex closer examination reveals itself to be a door, of pressing our eyes to the peepholes, alternately stretching or crouching to meet their gaze, depending on how short or tall we might be on that day, and seeing the unfathomably strange figure that lies beyond. If you have not crouched and stretched and lined your eyes up with these holes, you must get up right now and go to the museum and wait at the top of the stairs for the doors to open tomorrow morning. If you walk briskly, it will take you under five minutes to reach gallery 183 from the entrance. It is a walk that I have made many times before. My routine at the museum is simple and it nearly almost begi always begins or ends with a visit to this room. For the, Omar, for those of you, for those of you unfamiliar with the story, 25 years before Marcel Duchamp's death, he announced that he was giving up art for chess. For the last 20 years of his life, however, he worked on this, in a secret studio hidden behind the room in which he would receive challengers to his mastery of the board. Etantonet was revealed to the public only upon his death. Purpose built for this room in the Museum of Art, it has been installed permanently since 1969 and should remain in this spot so long as the museum is standing. For the first decades of its installation, photographic reproduction of the view beyond the peepholes was forbidden. In many ways, I wish that were still true, which is in part why I do not include an image tonight. The allure of this construction manifests itself in several ways. The one most relevant here, however, is not the strangeness of what lies behind the door, but the strangeness of the experience of looking at it. It is impossible to share the moment of looking with another person. There are only two eye holes, and our binocular vision dictates that we use them both. Museums are places for the public to see art together, which is why I relish the moments of privacy within them whenever and wherever they occur. You can only commune with Antoine on your own. I was fortunate enough to get to know the Philadelphia Museum of Art intimately while working on the exhibition Zoe Strauss, 10 years. I came to understand it in a variety of ways, some more secret than others, and a few of which I will share with you tonight. I will always remember taking the elevator to the very bottom, where the public is not supposed to go, where we, me and Zoe and Tony and Dan and Sam were also not supposed to go, and looking at the once planned halfway constructed grand staircase that actually leads to nowhere. If you walk behind the scrim that hangs in front of the large windows on the east side of the second floor, there are unlocked supply closets. The person who showed them to me discovered them as a teenager, and they happen to be the perfect size for certain teenage indiscretions. The exterior walls of the building are curved, something called entesis. Stand at the corners where they meet and look straight across. You will see them bend. The wings of the building were built first. The architects knew both that they would run out of money two-thirds of the way through the project and that the city would never let a gaping hole crown the great thoroughfare that is the parkway. The office of the curator of arms and armor is tucked above that gallery lined with swords and stained glass and shields because the person with the unpronounceable last name who gave the collection years ago said it must be so. There are other stories whose truth I am no longer sure of. The 16th century Indian temple hall that stands in the Asian wing was indeed bought on a honeymoon as a new bride's wedding present to herself. 
I cannot be sure, however, if she really did get divorced before the barge carrying the columns arrived back in the United States, but I am sure that I have told dozens of people that that is the case. I am interested in the hidden stories of great public institutions like the Philadelphia Museum of Art, of the ways in which individuals can forge connections with these types of monumental buildings and the objects which they house, how the public can be made personal, how secrets can feel like one's own. We have gotten rather far from the subject of postcards. In fact, the Philadelphia Museum of Art does not even really sell postcards. You can buy them in themed sets of 25, women, portraits, animals, sculpture, children, Renoir, late Renoir, etc. But the gift shop lacks my favorite part of any museum store, the racks and racks of individual postcards, a miniature mass-produced version of the museum itself. I hear that this is a point of contention within the museum's ranks. I have thought many times on it, but this massive over I, have thought, I have many thoughts on it, but this massive oversight is a topic for another time. The history of the postcard as a souvenir and as a document of art museums worldwide is a long and fruitful one. For now, though, I will leave you with one fact, which is that the first commercially produced postcard was manufactured in 1861 by John P. Charlton, right here in Philadelphia. To me, this seems enough reason for the art museum to revive their postcard production tomorrow. I did not develop any great affinities for Charlton's invention while in Philadelphia. I lived for the better part of one year in London. It was there where I fell in love with the postcard format. I traveled often to Paris, to Berlin, to the strangely fertile great cities of contemporary art in Western Germany, to Istanbul, to Copenhagen, to Amsterdam and Rotterdam and The Hague, to Geneva and Lucherbad, to cities all around England itself. I sent the general sort of wish you were here postcards to my friends and my parents and I collected images which I found compelling from museum gift shops. But I soon learned that the postcards I liked sending best of all were those whose messages spoke directly to the works of art on their backs. I am a curator and art historian by trade. I studied the history of art here at Penn and I work in the programming department at the Institute of Contemporary Art. At the time, I was enrolled in a curatorial studies master's program. This way of writing about art, constricted by a four inch by six inch square box, was new to me. I wrote regularly to many people, but this fashion of writing about and through and around art objects mainly manifested itself in my correspondence with one person. I realize now that we had been in love with one another for a while, but that 5,000 miles and mountains of pride and some degree of fear had kept that fact from being plainly stated. Instead, I wrote messages on the backs of Velasquez's Roque Be Venus and Manet's Olympia and Barth the Folie Berger and Modigliani's Female Nude and Courbet's Origin of the World and Cezanne's Mount Saint Victoire and many more. Postcards were a safe way to write, about, write around feelings. You can't be too explicit with these open backed messages. Other people will always read them. Postal workers, roommates sorting through the mail, strangers who pass through the foyer of the apartment building. Their full meaning only comes together in the hands of the person they are intended for. In open letters, a secret appears, but only if you are looking for it.